by two. Of... So I'll call the meeting to order. Hello, everybody. This is a meeting of the uh, Legislative Advocacy Committee of the Board of the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District. All committee members are present. Are there any changes to the agenda? No, there are not. Okay. Um, and we can take public comment if, if there is any. Now, I should note, I think one set of, a, of a minutes were distributed separately from the packet. So hopefully you all saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do we have, first of all, do we have any members of the public? I see one member of the public. So um, if any member, I don't, if any member of the public wishes to address the committee at this time, please raise your hand. Okay. Chair Paul, I see no raise hands. Okay. Or this. So we can, um, is there a motion uh, on the two sets of minutes? I'm happy to make a motion to approve the two sets of minutes. Thank I'll you. second it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We can do it that way, just three of us. Uh, Director Edwards? Aye. Okay, then uh, minutes are approved. Great. Okay. Item one. I that mean, was item, item one. Item two, so item, that yeah. was one. Yeah. All right. Discussion items. Item two. Yeah, Ferguson so, Group. Yeah. And Roger is on. Uh, he shows as Janet, uh, his aide, but um, Roger is here as are Chris Cummins and Chris Kearney. Um, I should point out, I had a conversation with uh, the new general manager that the County Water Resources Agency yesterday, uh, Ara Edzerian, and he said, Chris Kearney's hilarious. <laughs> and I didn't get any additional information on why who, he said that. <laughs> who, who is this, might I ask? <laughs> Ara, Ara Edzerian. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, very good guy. Like yeah. him a lot. Yeah, he, he was familiar with Mark and Chris, and he said yeah. I, that he didn't think he'd met Roger. Yeah, very good guy. Yeah. But apparently you're hilarious. Uh, okay. <laughs> you need humor in DC, you know, to be successful. So there, there you go. It's a key you go. ingredient. That's we'll take yeah, Chris, you were you were in the Senate uh committee at some point, right? Or I was right right before I came to Ferguson, I was four years at the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Yeah, I, I think you mentioned that as well. Yes, that's anyway. where we where we met. Great. Uh Roger, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so it's a pleasure to be with you. We appreciate the, the opportunity to present today. And so we're just going to give you an update on um, a couple of things, uh, just generally uh, you know, where things are uh, relative to some key issues, some issues that uh, of direct importance to the district, and then uh, give you an overview on a couple of other, some policy uh, discussions that are going on here in D.C. that uh, the, the uh, district would be interested in and an uh, update on um, some uh, tax-related concerns, issues that are going on that are, are uh, benefits that are, things are happening in the, uh, with Treasury that we think will be of interest to you, and, um, and then uh, the ledge tracker, um, uh, just an update there. So just in terms of um, the fiscal year 2024 appropriations process, things are moving along there, and with the uh, debt ceiling extension being dealt with, um, that clears the way for the whole appropriations process for FY24 to move forward in uh, it's fairly regular order. So we're expecting uh, the, and there are some incentives that were actually adopted as part of the debt ceiling extension that will encourage this to occur, but we're expecting everything to be kind of wrapped up between now and the end of the calendar year. If it goes beyond the, the calendar year, if the FY24 process goes beyond that, uh, starting uh, if it, things aren't wrapped up by January 1, uh, if there's a continuing resolution in place for any of the bills, any of the 12 appropriations bills that fund the federal government, um, there's a 1% across the board dis cut in, uh, in uh, dis discretionary spending for both defense and domestic purposes. And so that's a strong incentive for everybody, to, for the House and Senate, to, on both sides of the aisle to get things done. So 
The district has a, a pending allocate a pending request uh, that was supported by um, uh, uh, Senator Padilla for uh, funding for what's being listed. Uh, it's under it's through the Corps of Engineers and the Energy Water Appropriations Bill. Um, it's a uh, for uh, two point one five million dollars for what's uh, a group of projects that are being put under the title of Monterey Peninsula Stormwater Diversion and Recycling Program. Now, basically, this is funding to implement the authorization that was secured last year uh, that uh, Congressman Panetta uh, requested on behalf of the district uh, that allocated $20 million to the Corps of Engineers through a pro, uh, an authority called Environmental Infrastructure, otherwise called Section 219, but it's the Environmental Infrastructure Authority that gives the district access to up to $20 million on a 75-25 cost share basis for a whole host of uh, water related purposes. So what we're trying to do here is again, work with the district, work with your dis your uh, delegation to get dollars to jumpstart that whole process and have dollars uh, start to flow uh, through that authority to the benefit of the district and your partners. Um, and uh, on those lines to support that request, uh, uh, General Manager uh, Stolt uh, and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, some uh, you know, myself and others within TFG, some of our consultants, uh, including um, the uh, former chief counsel for the Corps of Engineers, uh, Earl Stockdale, and another fellow from headquarters who used to be at headquarters with the Corps, Brad Sprittenberg, um, had a meeting with uh, uh, the Corps uh, at the Sacramento, the San Francisco District Office, a virtual meeting, just to brief them on the project, on the uh, district's desire to partner with the core on water-related uh, priorities of the district, and uh, so that was an introductory call. And there will be, you know, that will that, that uh, uh, there will be future meetings along those lines, both for, you know, at, um, it's with the San Francisco District Office, the South Pacific Division. They are also in San Francisco, as well as the um, headquarters folks uh, in, in, in the in the you know going as we go forward with this process. Um, we uh, yeah, maybe that, Dave, I'll stop yeah, and on that topic, uh, that. Roger. Uh, just to let the committee know, we um, so there was change in command that occurred uh, on the twenty third. So on Monday of this week, we. So you see in uh, Exhibit 2B, a draft letter to Lieutenant Colonel Kevin Arnett. He is ascending to the South Pacific, uh, South Pacific region, and his new replacement, uh, the new commander, is a gentleman named Timothy uh, Shabesta. And so we actually formalized this letter on letterhead Monday to Timothy Shabesta. He is in commander school back in D.C. right now. Um, but he uh, went, a, went ahead and responded yesterday afternoon saying that he looked forward to getting together with uh, and working on this project with us. So we put that ball into motion. As Roger pointed out, the uh, request through Senator Padilla's office is only about uh, $2.1 million. So it's, it's not a huge uh, ticket, but this is uh, geared towards stormwater uh, diversion into the Pure Water Monterey project. So chances are there will only be enough money released to promulgate a contract to do the, you know, uh, to, to agree to do an agreement in the future for construction, but it's a start. So um, I'm feeling optimistic. Good. Yeah. Get it. It is, as Dave said, it's just a, it is a, just so it, it, the expectations are clear, you know, we, we are, uh, it takes a while, you know, this is, a, we feel it's certainly positive that uh, Senator Padilla made the request this year, just immediately after the, uh, uh, the authorization was secured and, uh, and, uh, you know, going forward, you know, we certainly uh, are optimistic that in the, over the relatively near term that we'll be in a position, you know, you'll be in a position to start securing some real meaningful assistance through the core, um, through this particular authority. Um, we'd also like to, along the same lines, we'll be working with the uh, district uh, bringing to your attention uh, some 
there are some little tweaks to the <laughs> that we would recommend that you consider asking uh, for uh, asking the uh, the uh, the core to make to the authority that will basically make it easier for um, these are kind of global changes that need to be made to the authority, not specific to the uh, to the, uh, mid uh, Monterey Peninsula uh, uh, authority, but um, that would make it easier for the core to provide the assistance to you. Uh, and to basically putting in place some reimbursement authority. And that's something we'll look forward to working with you as part of the Water Resource Development Act of 2024 and, uh, and the processes that lead up to that. Um, also, just uh, want to quickly mention two other things that I'll ask uh, um, uh, Chris Kearney to uh, give you a, an update on some policy related concerns. But one is that the Farm bill is uh, is moving forward, and there are going to be some elements we'll be reporting to in the future that will be of interest to you that deal with conservation titles. It'll create some additional re opportunities for funding for some of your resource-related ecosystem restoration, habitat-related improvements um, that um, will be of interest to you, and we'll keep you apprised of that. On the wa water authorization side, uh, just want to mention that uh, the again, as in as it, you did last year, a letter was sent uh, from um, the district to Senator Feinstein, a supporter for her water legislation, which still has not yet been introduced, but a stream act, it'll be introduced soon. And, uh, and it's a, a, a bill that provides additional authority for, uh, for water reuse, for water recycling uh, under the Title 16 program, which you've benefited from in the past as well as uh, other um, authorities, groundwater recharge, groundwater uh, uh, related projects as well, groundwater storage projects. Yeah, and that, um, that letter is the back, the, the last page of the uh, packet today. So just so you can see what, what the sense is fine. Great, and then the, the uh, with that, and I, I don't know, the only other thing just specific to, uh, um, the district, I don't know if we, we, since the last meeting, the meeting at Aqua, um, I don't know, Dave, if you wanted to talk about that, but um, if that was something I wanted to raise. That yeah, we did meet with the, um, the Western uh, staff. Actually, um, the there was a deputy secretary in that meeting i can't recall. deputy secretary yeah for the for water and science gary yeah. gold was there as well yeah um but primarily it was the pacific uh staff uh ernest um uh, conan yeah, ernest yeah. Conan. yeah. Conan, um kind of his team was there and we just reinforced our at this meeting was basically to say thank you again for all of the the grant monies. You may recall that the expansion of Pure Water Monterey has a $10.3 million uh, Title 16 grant that goes to Monterey One Water, but its genesis was uh, all the way back in time when we made the rounds in DC probably six years ago, which led to the first, you know, roughly $19.6 million, uh, which was used on the base project. So, um, that meeting was during Aqua in May, uh, but just another touch uh, jointly between uh, Monterey One Water and ourselves and uh, and TFG was uh, along with a, a Mark Limbaugh uh, in that case. So, yeah. And certainly uh, reclamation continues to be very, you know, positive towards you, your partners, you know, on, on the great work uh, that you guys do there. and. Uh, Sees you as a strong partner uh, in, in on the water water issues. Mary, Mary, while we have you here on this committee, um, Carmel River Free, we have a sub grant uh, from our IRWM monies, and the county is the lead on that sub grant. Um, and I can't remember the woman's name, but uh, I was surprised that it wasn't Big Sur Land Trust. But if the county is the the lead for that grant, what Roger mentioned in terms of uh, watershed, you know, wildlife, um, you know, that kind of legislation, we may not be able to use it for our purposes, but the county might be able to use it for the Carmel River Free Project 
So that's something that you know I'll make a note of, and then when Roger and I talk a little bit later uh, uh, over that, maybe we can steer something in the county's direction to serve as a, a leadership position on. That's excellent. That's a really good idea. And and about how much do you think it would be? I don't know. I don't know what their authorization is. We right. really haven't talked about well, it. Well, yeah, anything it, else. <laughs> Yeah, the equip was well, one of the great things that's being discussed. Actually, this is an amendment that Senator Feinstein's um, uh, authoring. It would allow the district actually to be an applicant for funding under equip, which is not uh, currently that's not currently available to uh, to the district. It actually, actually, all the dollars have to go to producers under the current rules. But um, you know, so anyway, there's some could be some opportunities there. There's certainly some additional opportunities too. Uh, within the monies that are available for uh, that are in the infrastructure package and the Inflation Reduction Act, some additional dollars are provided there under National Marine Fisheries Service, as well again in habitat focused dollars. And yeah, that, certainly, uh, yeah, that's what we need make to sure that, yeah. Yeah. make sure you're aware of all of those opportunities. Great, get assist Thank there. You. Mm -hmm. With that, let me just turn over to Chris and, and talk to you about a couple of the policy uh, concerns. Yep. Uh, just a few things. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, on building on what Roger talked about on the Stream Act, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee is going to be likely to hold a hearing on Western water bills um, that have been introduced uh, as of last week. They had kind of a cutoff of last week. So there is expected to be a hearing in mid-July and then markup and reporting of bills out in um, September, October timeframe to be ready for the floor as we move to the inevitable crazy sort of end of, of year activities. The STREAM Act probably is not technically eligible under that process. That's why they won't likely be on the agenda. But certainly, um, if they are able to find someone to offer the bill as an amendment, that may be one way it comes up, or if there's some sort of floor consideration of a water package or some other vehicle. So uh, that's why we're continuing to follow it, stay engaged and keep keep track to see where that where that um, where that goes. But if you happen to hear about the committee having a Western water bill markup and you don't hear or see about the Stream Act, that's because of that what their sort of intent, internal rules were. But it doesn't mean the end of of the process for sure. Um, the other thing just kind of that we're watching that's in the background that indirectly uh, affects you or may is you may have read in this part of the debt ceiling bill. There was um, efforts to put uh, forward some permitting reform. Um, act provisions related to, the, to to NEPA, particularly, it was really aimed at sort of streamlining kind of the paperwork and permitting process, kind of what a lot of us inside the Beltway kind of call the sort of the easy, the easy picks, the not very heavy lifting stuff. Important matters in terms of length of pages, how long you can take to uh, review and process permits, giving a lead agency to um, designate a lead agency in the case of a permit for maybe even a water storage project or a pipeline or something like that uh, to help, you know, good government sorts of activities to expedite the process. They left sort of on the cutting room floor for future conversations. How do you deal with what happens if there are lit is there litigation, if there are lawsuits and they get caught up in the courts? One of the ongoing challenges of projects of all kinds, renewal energy, fossil energy, water projects, storage, the whole nine yards has been the litigation aspect where, you know, there are there are horror stories of projects tied up in litigation for six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 years. So it's a bit of a flashpoint and a dividing point between the parties. Uh, there's lots of conversations going on in the Senate, uh, less so in the House. Um, and there's a desire to come up with a bipartisan solution um, on potentially on matters related to litigation, as well as on transmission. Um, there are issues related to transmission. That's that sort of uh, spending folks are spending a lot of time chatting about uh, where where that might affect water projects or where that might affect things that have you know we care about directly it remains to be seen. The good news is the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and their staffs are directly engaged in this, and that includes uh, the staff that oversees Bureau of Reclamation and all things water. So we continue to to follow that. We don't we don't see anything you know earth shattering getting to the president's desk uh, anytime soon. But the Senate folks certainly feel a little bit of pride of their authorship was kind of hijacked by the debt ceiling bill because they were putting a lot of work into it. So that that continues apace uh, in the background and we continue to track that. 
the other area that uh, we're watching for you as well, that that kind of is a um, ongoing uh, that may get uh, some traction as time goes on, is in the area of endangered species in the Endangered Species Act reform arena. Broadly speaking, uh, two things happening there. One last Thursday, the uh, Biden administration announced a three pa a regulatory package consisting of three separate rules jointly by NIMPS. Uh, the, the Marine Fishery Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, mostly process management, good government reforms, but um, and some changing some of the Trump administration's reforms that they had done, uh, but but then instituting some new ones. One of them being um, removing economic considerations from listing a species uh, and limiting it to just. Um, essentially the best available science and commercial impacts. Uh, the other, which doesn't necessarily directly affect nymphs and say salmon, but it does broadly with the Fish and Wildlife Service, is the question of making equal treatment of endangered and threatened species. Um, you're essentially not going to be allowed to do uh, take or elimination. You're not going to be, you essentially have to treat them the same. So if it's a threatened species, you now will operate on the same standard unless you have, but what they're going to put in place is what's called a blanket 4D rule, which um, essentially lays that foundation where you treat them, whether it's endangered or threatened, you treat it the same for purposes of managing it, but you can have exceptions. So where the, you know, I think that's something Dave will want to work with you. And as we delve more deeply into what is several hundred pages of rulemaking, where there may be some benefits and opportunities, things there we may want to applaud, uh, things we may want to, to make them aware of on the water side. So we're continuing to um, dig into that and we'll we'll be in touch as that goes. In terms of legislation, the House of Representatives and House Republicans are interested in um, ESA reforms. They're still trying to figure out what that looks like. They have a lot of members that have a lot of different viewpoints on the Endangered Species Act and in particularly in the area of listing uh, and in the area of critical habitat criteria for defining what is critical habitat, you know, that sort of thing, emphasis enhancing partnerships with states and localities and in part and interests. And then they have some more sort of extreme things. So they are spending a lot of time behind the scenes, getting building up, uh, getting ready for hearings. They've already had some hearings on some species specific issues that are controversial. They're looking at some broader programmatic things. We think it'll be much more of a, a visible issue in 2024 as we move forward. So we're continuing to engage there and keep track. And then finally, um, back on the regulatory side or on the on the agency side. Hey, Chris, hang on just a second. Yes, sir. Um, I just found something I can't do. Sarah, would you move Ian into the meeting and move Alvin out of the meeting? Sure. One minute, please. Okay. Thanks. Go ahead, Chris. And so uh, one really important thing on the clean energy side as part of the or the as part of the administration's effort to uh, advance their clean energy objectives and goals, particularly the broader one of a decarbonized economy by, by 2050, was a very large package of renewable energy tax credits that were included as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the centerpiece of that is to take um, not only to have credits for EVs, both commercial and for private, but also for solar and wind, um, as well as long-term battery storage. That what's new is not that necessarily those tax credits, they've been in place for many years, certainly in terms of projects. What's different and maybe particularly of interest to us is that they've modified who's eligible. Uh, and so they've dramatically expanded so that uh, local communities, you know, JPAs, special districts are now eligible for um, these credits in the form of essentially a payment, whereas previously they were only uh, only folks who were essentially in the nonprofit side, project developers and IOUs and that sort of thing were previously eligible. So where we are right now is Treasury Department has moved to the point where they have uh, launched recently a 60 day comment period uh, regarding the the eligibility rules and in particular kind of the meat and potatoes, you know, the really in the weeds um, means by which you apply for those credits, how you demonstrate your eligibility, both in a macro sense and then in terms of the actual project itself. And so I think that's a place we'll want to visit Dave about perhaps some comments, just, you know, a number of folks are weighing in from California and elsewhere, not it, the, the eligibility is great. The, 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 the law and what they're trying to do is, you know, they're trying to help folks like us. So that was the intent, but we, this is the opportunity to make sure that when you move for some sort of legislation, when you move from legislating to the regulatory aspect of this and you get into the actual weeds and the mechanics of how this is going to work, driving home the point of who's truly 
explicitly eligible since some of it's first time and new, and then also making sure that as they implement the, the various specific steps to how you apply and get pre-approved and so forth and make sure you get the money, that that process is as streamlined and is efficient and as user-friendly as possible. So that's a couple of the areas that we are um, working on. So any questions before we turn over to Chris to talk about the tracker? Yeah, Chris, on that, um, you, you guys sent out a, a communication and then the next day, I think you sent out an updated communication. Do they need to be read together or does the second one cover the first one and on the well, credit? No, this is on the credit. The second one has the is probably yeah, the easiest one. It's got because it's got the little uh, summary, basically a link, hyperlink to a, a, a brief summary of how the okay. how this so will work. All what's I need is the second one then. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank the main you. thing I think there is it gonna be again, it's uh any vehicles includes trucks, you know, certainly regular vehicles. You'll be able to get that tax credit that was otherwise only available to uh, uh, for-profit entities, but also, uh, again, to degree, maybe thinking about investing in any sort of uh, renewables, uh, you know, that associated with pumping facilities or, you know, anything, any of your operations, you know, that, yeah. that would certainly be an eligible uh, a situation where you would be able to get dollars for those investments too, as well. Again, as, as Chris said, that it's comparable to the tax credit that would otherwise be available to a for-profit entity. And again, this will be available under this, this change in law for the next 10 years. And the other the other point that I think is really worth uh, noting for, for like normal folks outside the Beltway is the administration views this as the implementation of all matters related to the Inflation Reduction Act, particularly in terms of the clean energy tax credit basket and the related, they've stood up a specific office that is that is essentially the Office of Inflation Reduction Act implementation with some pretty high powered and seasoned folks overseeing it who know how the government works, precisely to make sure that the, that the, they are driving these processes and the regulations and, and the mechanisms uh, to conclusion as quickly as possible and as most effectively as possible and that they don't just you know, linger and drift into the election year and beyond. So they're actually folks every day coming to the White House worried about this sort of thing. And, you know, that's um, in the case of major pieces of legislation, that's not that's not historically the case. So I think that's a really good sign in terms of, of the prioritization and likelihood of success here. Great. Very good news. Yes. Uh, before we move on, I, I just want um, for the record to note that um, Director Oglesby has joined the meeting uh, when we began the meeting, uh, Director Edwards, who's the alt an alternate member of, of this committee, uh, uh, started the meeting. And he he has now uh, left the meeting. So we have three directors. Yep. So Chris, if you want to talk a little bit about the legislative sure. track. So yeah, I'll, I'll call your attention really quickly to a couple of bills that are included in the tracker, and we'll um, circulate some more as as uh, updates come come with that. Um, HR 872 that can be found on page three from uh, Representative uh, Calvert uh, is the uh, Federally Integrated Species Health Act, um, and that works to consolidate a lot of the regulations that uh, Chris Kearney spoke about uh, previously. Uh, into the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and that gives an, an opportunity to have an easier um, go at things with, you know, fair shake at regulations that are included in that. Um, and then with HR 215, and that's on page five, there's a uh, Water for California Act, um, and that's a, an opportunity for streamlining uh, operations and expanding water storage and infrastructure, um, and serves to increase accountability as well. Um, and then um, the uh, Wildfire Emergency Act of 2023 um, is an opportunity to, uh, and that's that's S188. Um, that's an opportunity to assist with uh, some watershed uh, cleanup um, through uh, the implementation of landscape forest restoration projects. Um, included in that is also uh, HR 186 from uh, Congressman McClintock, and that's the Water Supply Permitting Coordination Act. Uh, and that uh, provides permitting process to help streamline uh, construction of new water uh, storage projects. Um, and separately to this, there's um, mention of the Recovering uh, America's Wildlife Act or, or RAWA, which has apparently gained a lot of steam um, behind the scenes. And that's something that could serve as an opportunity for um, a, a larger bill to work towards uh, funding 
habitat management and that could exist in the, the watershed as well. Uh, so that's something to follow that might have traction outside of uh, some of these one-off legislation items. Um, we'll be sure to, to follow up with more to come. Um, just really quickly, I have a question. And, and by the way, I think the McClintock bill is um, kind of designed to uh, expedite the sites reservoir uh, project here in the state. Um, you know, that's, that's its real hidden intent. Um, on the, the fish bill, the Calvert one, is this moving authority away from NOAA to U.S. Fish and Wildlife? Right. Yeah, this is Correct. for all ESA related regulatory. So where would where would NIMPS would NIMPS just pick up and move over to? Yeah. Yeah, this uh, yeah, be moved to Department of Interior. This is the one he's had. This is the third, maybe fourth Congress he's done this. It's yeah. a very, it's a very simple bill. He knows there would be a whole separate set of activities that would be related. But the idea is, it makes no sense to have two agencies administering, you know, one stat. Uh, we just always found it kind of uh, ironic that the chain that the Commerce Secretary, who's trying to, you know, expand the economy, has oversight on NOAA, which has oversight on NIMPS, which ESA tends to battle with economic expansion. So it just it never struck us as a great fit. Uh -huh. The story, well, the the story is that Richard Nixon had a fight with the the, the supposed story is that Nixon had a fight with one of his cabinet secretaries. And splitting this off and sticking part of it in commerce was um, in response. A solution, huh? That <laughs> it's the fairly ver fairly verified story is that this goes back to uh, a fallout uh, from the Nixon administration, <laughs> which is why there's no statutory or regulatory rationale because people actually tracked it back to that. So it doesn't. Huh. It's like having the Forest Service at USDA. It's, yeah. it's, it's sort of the same. Okay, so we would very much be interested in what happens with this. You say it's the third time he's tried, so it hasn't gotten the traction. This is at least the third. Yeah, this is at least the third Congress that he's introduced him. To. Okay, yeah, we spend an inordinate amount of time with NIMPS, and uh, this is interesting. But mm -hmm. I wasn't aware of that. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris, and Chris, and Roger. Um, Thank you. Director Paul, I think we're ready to move on to Sacramento. Thank you very, yeah, thank you very much. And um, if there are no more questions for Ferguson, um, we thank you for being here today. I don't know if you uh, if you have reasons to to stay for the state part of our agenda. You feel you're of course welcome. Um, over to our 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 state at lobbyists. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, John Arriaga, and I have Lori uh, Johnson uh, with me, and uh, we'll give you an overall of where we're at right now in the uh, in this year, the uh, legislative process. Uh, these are very exciting times. Uh, there's been a lot going on both in the legislature. Uh, Lori will talk about the legislation and budget uh, uh, situation uh, we're at now today. Uh, but come uh, Friday, we have a changing of the guard, and uh, Assemblymember Rivas will, will take over the helm as a speaker for the California Assembly. So I understand there's a lot of people coming from the Monterey and San Benito area up to uh, Sacramento. So if any of you yeah. are in town, by all means, get a hold of Lori Ryan. We'll, we'll, we'll join you for, uh, for some time. Uh, but having yeah, said I that... Think I think most people are going for the party on Thursday night and skipping <laughs> probably, probably that. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's that's a lot of there's a lot of truth to that. I think as <laughs> well, I don't think people like to hope that they can get into the gallery or on the floor. So yeah, very doubtful. Yeah, but yeah, they're yeah. everybody's spending the night, so they're probably going to be around. You know. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Lori to actually get into the legislation and budget uh, subject matter. Okay, um, so my budget update provided in the memo, um, it's still somewhat accurate. Um, a lot has been going on in this last week since I drafted this. As of last night, the governor has signed a $311 billion budget. Um, as I noted in the memo, this was really kind of hung up and I'm sure everyone heard that uh, late in the game, he uh, unveiled uh, an 11, um, 
uh, series infrastructure package that he wanted to rush through the budget process, this huge pushback um, for the legislature because, you know, as this does, this is going to try to expedite large water storage and infrastructure projects by kind of, um, you know, we don't like to use the word weakening, but maybe sequel light um, on the judicial review, the length of hearing, what can be considered at all levels um, of the government. Um, the one that was really, really kind of prickling um, uh, the Central Valley Democrats and even some of the Republicans was that he wanted to put the Delta t Conveyance Project um, under this fast track. Um, this is what we're really, really holding the budget up as they needed to come to an agreement before he signed the final uh, spending package. As of yesterday, uh, early morning, uh, 11 trailer bills were released without the Delta conveyance project. So they were heard this afternoon and will be going before the legislature tomorrow for their um, approval and his signature and the governor's signature of those bills. So that, you know, some pundits are saying that is the final nail in the coffin uh, for the controversial longstanding $16 billion Delta uh, tunnel project. But going back to the budget itself, uh, of just the complexity of it, um, number one, we have the largest deficit that we have had in, in recent memory. Um, and this is a depth, you know, anywhere from 30.7 billion to 31.5 billion. And a lot of these legislators, except for, you know, veterans, um, they've been dealing with surpluses. Uh, but Unlike yesteryears where we were slashing a lot of social service programs, um, the state has been really good with the help of Jerry Brown and Governor Newsom and the legislature of building a healthy reserve and building more budget tools. And so they were able to close the $30 billion plus gap without really any um, cuts to social programs, homelessness. Um, in fact, uh, for the first time in many years, uh, Medi-Cal reimbursement rates are gonna go up. Um, child, low-income child care will be going up. So they're still investing um, in programs while covering their basis. And a lot of people say, you know, without touching um, any of the rainy day funds or any of the special funds, um, you know, how California is doing it. The, the interesting thing about this governor, and, and you've noticed, and we've talked about it before, is that He's doing multi-year budgets, uh, anywhere from one to five years. Mostly they're from two to three years. And so when he can sit there and talk and say, I've given $20 billion for homelessness or $56 billion for climate change. Yes, that's true, but that is over multiple years. And so how they're kind of covering their bases is that they're delaying some of the multi-year funding. They're cutting some of the multi-year funding. And it is covering those gaps and also while investing in our savings, in retirement, paying off our debts and whatnot. So, you know, it, it's not smoke and mirrors, um, but it's not the strongest budget we've ever had. Um, and another real big hiccup, as we all know, because of the severe storms that we had um, earlier in the year, is that the, both the federal government and the state have delayed uh, tax filing and tax payments to October 16th. According to the Legislative Analyst Office, this is, you know, they're having to project what they anticipate coming in. The LAO says it's about 42 million. The state says it's, the Department of Finance says it's mm -hmm. higher. Uh, it's fluctuating. So there is a real possibility that they could come back um, before the end of the year to try to do a, a, a budget light to deal with any uh, excess or really significant drop in revenue. Um, however, one of the victims of the budget uh, of, you know, uh, where there's been heavy investment uh, is the multi-year commitment uh, for climate change. And it took about almost a $3 billion hit. Mm. Um, so they said, Newsom says to make up for the cuts and, and what uh, the Ferguson group was talking about is that they're gonna seek uh, federal climate change funding uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And Newsom's also coming out in strong support of a number of climate water bond um, initiatives that are moving through the legislature, will, which I will touch upon um, 
later. And just as a procedural with the budget, um, you know, bracing for any further, again, going on further declines of revenue, um, they allowed the governor to delay uh, with notification the legislature any one time funding uh, before March 1st. So they did kind of put in some uh, kind of covering their bases of giving authority. But, you know, after COVID, they're not giving the governor a uh, blanket authority as they once did. Um, so with that said, uh, the legislature right now, we have about two weeks. It will be going on summer recess on July 14th, again, where they will be passing anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, budget trailer bills um, to implement this budget. And then they will be off for one month and come back for a month and uh, finish up the year's work and then adjourn for the year. So that is what I have for the budget. Are there any questions? Yeah, Laura, I'm going to share screen on something just quickly for my directors to better understand this. Um, all right. Thanks so much. So this is corporate taxes to the state general fund the last five years. And you can see, you know, we were in the 12 and 13 for three years when money was tight. We jumped to 21 million, I'm sorry, 20, yeah, 21 billion in 2021, and then 46 billion in 2022. And what they were estimating for 22-23 was a loss of almost eight billion. And so this is the, the game that the state has been playing is it um it's somewhat unpredictable. You know, as I've kind of said when when Apple has a bad year, um it really does have an impact on the state budget. So that's that's kind of what what we're seeing. Yeah. So we got really <laughs> lucky because our earmark was set in this time frame. Uh, when they were at 47 billion of corporate taxes. So, um, but our earmark is assured, you know, it's only 4.6 million, but we've got that agreement in place. We finalized it uh, last week. So we're, we're good. Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. You know, what reading all the pundits and especially the LAO that the state, you know, really relies on the three sources of taxes, what Dave was saying, corporate taxes, you have your income taxes, and then you have your capital gains. And it goes back to your Apple, uh, you know, kind of uh, note that if the stock market is really slumping, you are going to see California's revenues really dive down. We rely heavily on capital gains tax and no one is, no one's uh, selling their stock. Everyone's holding on, hoping for an upswing. And so it's really, really impacting, you know, um, the budget. Whereas in COVID years, no one could move, no one could leave. So every, I mean, I'm sure we know everyone that was doing home improvement projects. Well, how are they funding that? Well, they were selling stock because the stock market was happening to do very well. And that's how we got this ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous surplus. Because people say, how can you go, you know, from, you know, to 50 billion. Room to bust. Uh, exactly. That we absolutely flipped upside down. Um, and it's the fact that, you know, and also the tech, the tech boom is, is kind of simmering down with the layoffs and whatnot. And um, again, that's loss of income tax, that's loss of capital gains. Um, so we, ex and the LAO is, is saying to expend this, expect this trend. However, hiring is up um, and wages are up in California. So we have this really, this, this disparaging of seeing how it's gonna equal out. So, um, but it was a very, very highly contested uh, budget negotiations um, regarding this infrastructure streamline, but the governor got what he wanted, but not the crown jewel, which was that Delta, the Delta tunnels. So um, again, they, they, the legislature will pass uh, these bills tomorrow. They will go have a wonderful time and drinks with you guys at the bank to celebrate uh, newly elected Speaker Rivas and then business for the next two weeks. Great. 
Um, did we want to cover anything off the legislative track or is it yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna because there are some updates and i'll be very quick about this so um again the track is attached but i really kind of wanted to uh, look at the legislative update yeah. of uh the position bills uh that the district has taken um and, and again we really do look as aqua as a partner if we are asked by aqua to take a position on bills um you know we are we are inclined to do so especially in coalition um so the first two bills i just kind of want to address as a whole um and i don't know if uh you know it, it's made its way down regionally but there's a been a loud 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 drum um banging especially up here on revising the state's water rights um, that they are archaic, they are racist, they're antiquated, they are whatnot, that these were done a long time ago and that they completely need to be redone. Neither of these bills addresses that, but what they are doing is they are bringing up the issue of water rights by, by slowly kind of taking a little policy issue over here and a policy issue over there and essentially get, giving the uh, state water research control board more authority of really digging into these water rights so i kind of look at them as a package however they they aqua is approach approaching both of these differently um the bauer con bill ab60 they um amendments were taken this monday aqua says we're still opposed however with 1337 with wix they are making headway uh, with the author's office. So they're kind of pulling back their full, you know, board advocacy to negotiate with the author. Yeah, um, and, and these are beginning on page 22 of your packet where Lori's highlighted uh, some of the bills we've got positioned. I should tell you that <clears throat> at the personal request of Aqua's executive director, um, Dave Egerton, um, the district did a letter of oppose unless amended for both of these bills. Um, and that request came a week before we had an in-person meeting with John and uh, Lori uh, and, and assembly member Don Addis, where we sent the letter, told her chief of staff, we'd explain it when we got up there. It's not really our issue, but um, it could be one day if somebody wanted to increase uh, environmental flows in the Carmel River. Um, but it's really a Central Valley issue primarily. But when Aqua makes a request, you know, we try to be supportive. I can tell you that um, despite the letter and despite the in-person meeting and explaining the letter, uh, Assemblymember Addis voted in favor of the two bills, not following our recommendation uh, of oppose. And we were probably the first water district in her district that uh, had, has met with her. So um, she's a member of the Progressive Caucus and she kind of voted along with them rather than with uh, her constituent uh, district. So, which is okay. So it's, it's I gather, I'm sorry. I was just saying it's okay that she voted yeah. in opposition to what we advocated because um, we weren't that wedded to it anyway. So I gather that both of these bills really address water rights only in a very narrow sense, right? Just the authority of the state water board to curtail. Yeah, it gives them more administrative uh, control. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what about the, the larger issue that, um, Laura, you referred to the drumbeat of the need to reform our water laws? Of the, the, I, I know a lot of work's been done on that. And it's been studied and there are recommendations, but I'm not following closely. Is, is there legislation in the works uh, about that? No, I, there's no over overarching legislation. Usually with big issues like this, they start with little bills like and taking the recommendations. And one of the recommendations, as David said, is, is uh, giving the board more authority to really examine these rights, to look at them, to restructure them, the fines of um, abusing those rights to really kind of put more enforcement, punitive damages, all that. That is the low hanging fruit. So what you're seeing in these bills is the low hanging fruit to the bigger issue that you we are going to see for the next 
because it's going to take a long time. I mean, this is going to be a huge fight for water rights. Um, and, you know, between, between ag industry, the state, environmentalists, private owners, farmers, we are going to, it's going to be a larger issue. So, you know, what I've kind of been told and what we're seeing is, again, this is, um, it's the beginning. And why Aqua is so steadfast, even though it is, I would not say this is innocuous at all. It's the beginning and it's precedent. And once you do, once you open the door, um, bigger legislation will come through. That's more harmful to water agencies, et cetera, and other constituencies. Yeah, so, Lori, I don't know if you got uh, during the Aqua's legislative briefing on Monday, if, if you attended, but they put out a request for water districts to testify against these bills, um, I think yesterday or today or tomorrow, sometime this week. So they're, they're still going kind of full guns. Um, I was on that meeting. They said they were going to back off on the Wix one. They were going full uh, bore on uh, the, Cower, the Bauer can bill. Gotcha. Because she she's not well, she is negotiating. She's just not negotiating with Aqua. Yeah. Um, so there were she did take up committee amendments. Um, one uh, and I'll take the water bonds uh, up as collectively. Uh, one that has changed is AB fifteen seventy two Freeman. Uh, this is dealing with non functional turf. Um, Aqua was successful in recent amendments in exempting multifamily housing. So they are gonna be, uh, re they're having their state legislative committee next week and they are going to reconsider their position to neutral. So, so when, that- When do you think that'll get a floor vote? Probably after the recess. August. August. Yeah, August. Because- yeah. Uh, yeah, our, our people downstairs are actually looking forward to some sort of definition on non-essential turf and I think they're actually relishing putting a regulation into place uh, and trying to enforce it so okay yeah no I um seeing that, that she made nice nice with aqua uh, I see this and this has been an issue that they're trying to resolve I see this going through but um, again it will not go into effect um until January 1st. And if it does require regulations to be promulgated, you've got 90 days after that. So I don't know the immediacy of your needs downstairs, but um, I, th I think uh, the definition will come sooner rather than later. Um, and then the water bond bills. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about these. This is gonna be the largest water bond effort um, that California has ever endeavored. We have two bills. They're essentially the same. They're still hammering it out. As you know, we do one in the assembly, one in the Senate. Uh, there are some, you know, categorical and priority differences, not great, but the biggest difference is, is that the assembly bill places this on the, the March primary ballot. Like we are going at it March. Let's get this done. Uh, and now the governor has endorsed it uh, again, because he wants to backfill his cuts uh, and, and appease the environmentalists. Um, whereas the Senate bill SB 867, that is a future election to be determined. Um, you know, at one point they're gonna have to work these bills out because the governor can't sign one uh, or cannot sign both. So they're gonna have to come into a big, one big water bond package. Hmm. Um, you know, as I feel like I say this every meeting, as we have been attending and participating in the last five years, uh, the water bond coalitions, Aqua's position is, of course, a support unless amended. You know, their position is, of course, we're going to support $15 billion of funding in any water infrastructure, any water quality, habitat, et cetera, climate, you know, but, but they have their, you know, where they want $500 million for conveyance here and here and here. So it goes down really to the particulars of Aqua, but in the general scheme of thing, everyone loves it and we're supportive. And so, yes, we are on uh, their coalition letter uh, as support unless amended, uh, but, not, but not support nonetheless. And I should point out we're on Aqua's coalition letter, but there's another coalition out there that we may bring to the board a resolution to participate in that coalition 
um, but we haven't done so yet. So that what may... coalition of yeah, Lori, did you ever figure out who what that coalition was? Uh, it's still pretty underground. I I have been asking around and no one's heard of it. Yeah. So, so, uh, so until I, we I, really I've find actually... out who the leader of the coalition is, we're not going to join. But we were told we could join if if our board passes a resolution to join. And uh, <laughs> we need to know who's asking. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I'm going to be getting together with some of my environmental uh, water colleagues. So, um, you know, I'll kind of peer in because it's one of those things that, you know, you need to know, but why don't they want you to know and kind of figuring it out, you know, who's really leading it beyond who's leading it, who's funding it. Well, and we think that it's it's a coalition of the IRWM uh, agencies. So, like we're we're the the focal point for the Monterey Peninsula integrated regional water management planning function. Then there's a Greater Monterey County that includes the County Water Resources Agency and uh, Marina Coast. And so these different planning groups have some similar consultants that span different groups. So we think that it may have come from that because the thrust of the this coalition has been to increase the amount of money for IRWM grant programs. But uh, yeah, it's just one of these mysteries that, you know, you know, it's the two guys meet in a bar on a Friday and there's a new coalition by Monday. Yeah. On the back of a napkin. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And especially around possible possible initiatives, like back in the day, you know, we all know that League of Cities would partner with um, uh, Aqua or CSAC to create this little subsection mm -hmm. to do polling on possible, you know, uh, like when they wanted to amend uh, Prop 218 and the stormwater that they were creating all these subgroups. And yeah. so it, it's, I think Dave, you're right, that it's somewhat like that because um, it, it is after these bonds and they are initiative and they could be the ones helping fund it and the political wing of it. So um, yeah, I just have to dig around a little bit more. Um, it's just, and it's not, no one's, no one's not talking, is it? No one really knows about it. Yeah. So um, right. we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, and, and lastly, uh, we have our former Senator Caballero, SB 6366. Uh, this is an Aqua sponsored bill. This is just a feel good one. It's just basically uh, you need to up, you need to update the state water plan and maybe be more comprehensive of where the state's water needs are now, drought, et cetera, um, to get a better picture of are we meeting our needs and where we're falling short and what we can do. So that's just in general of, of a good thing that we should be doing. So um, are there any questions on the position bills? Just a, a background question is the state water plan, is that in practice, does it matter? In practice, is it useful? Is it uh, followed, uh, you know, at least yeah. as a guide? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, it, it does. And what you saw at the Coastal Commission hearing for the Cal Diesel project is almost a direct off, um, offshoot of that kind of state water plan. Um, we need more desal. The governor declares. The Secretary of Resources then is empowered to go uh, chase it. And the water plan, the next edition of the water plan, is going to have a, a greater emphasis on desalination as a result. And uh, so that. You do see um, large scale California policy storage, for example, the last, the Prop 1, the last water bond of any size had an amazing amount of water for storage. And it basically put the, uh, oh God, it's another organization, California Water. There's Department of Water Resources, the State Water Board. But it put a third state agency uh, in business to uh, allocate money for storage projects. And so, yeah, the, it comes out of the, the state water plan process. Thank you. Um, I did want to touch just briefly on our visits. Um, you yeah. have material yeah. in your packet. Um, we did meet with uh, 
assembly member Addis. We gave her uh, some information on page 50 through 51 of your packet, just on who her water agencies are. That's great. Yeah, oh, and that's good, kind of what, what we, yeah, what, that's what we've tried to do with new legislators is give them a briefing and overview mm -hmm. on, on water issues. Um, we already talked about the uh, letter that we had written regarding water rights um, that didn't sway her vote. We presented to her uh, the water-related bills that we're following that have impacts on the Central Coast. And, uh, and it was a good, it was an amicable meeting. She's coming to Pure Water Monterey for a tour. Oh, good. Um, which we will participate in. Um, Monterey One Water has not met with her in person yet. So I think our visit was a good visit. Um, our visit was punctuated by a brief uh, kind of hello, how you doing meeting with Robert Rivas, the new speaker. Oh, mm -hmm. yay. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that goes to John and the relationship he's built up. He can stick his head in uh, Rivas's office and everybody knows him there. Um, so that was uh, that was a good just uh you know hi how you doing see you in a month uh for the party uh and so forth so uh, then we met with senator laird um same review of the bills um but we did present uh pro forma legislation which appears in page 59 of your packet which is real generic legislation that would allow us to um to have the cease and desist order not enforced on new connections for housing um, during the period of time while, while we're waiting to relieve the, the community from the CDO. And it did not get much traction. Uh, by John? By John. Uh, John glanced at it, handed it off to a staffer. Uh, I gave Kate a copy of everything we presented to John in Sacramento on the next day. She actually liked the legislation. Um, and if you read it, it, you know, you can figure out how many cease and desist orders there are and how many uh, are likely to be modified by something like this. But, you know, it would have to be a gut and amend style thing or be introduced in February of the next session um, or an amendment to something water related some of these other bills but uh, john didn't jump at it um but maybe we'll resurrect it at some point yeah i i, I think he was um he danced around it he didn't say no to it he said it was certainly worth looking into it further uh said uh you know maybe a stakeholders meeting might might be in line uh, sometime uh in the next several months so we could uh, vet the issue yeah. um but but I, he he did put it in a way that I don't think he was too interested in introducing legislation. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that that Kellam would not be too excited about uh, this legislation with their desal uh, uh, project there in the wings. So uh, we'll see. But it, it it certainly does have a lot of merit, and I I think uh, Dave the the meeting you had the following day with the uh, staff there at the uh, State Water Resource Board, uh, you know, some indication of, of that. So. Yeah, and, and I'll touch on that just briefly. I met with the Deputy Director of Water Rights, who's the primary enforcement official of the CDO, about our desire, with or without CalAM, to start the process of having the CDO lifted. Um, I may have mentioned this to some of you before, um, but uh, his response is favorable. Um, he identified concerns that had been raised about the drought resilience of the pure water expansion and ASR, which means he's either seen testimony or he's had it synopsized for him. But that was Calam's talking points during the phase one process of the expansion uh, application in front of the PEC. But I also said, you know, the, the CDO was issued because there was trespass under section uh, 1052 of the state water code and they're no longer in trespass uh, and what trespass means is you're basically taking more water than you're legally entitled to 
And as long as we can demonstrate that they're no longer a trespass, there should not be a CDO. And the problematic aspects of the CDO for us are all the safeguards, the, the guardrails that they put into it, like condition two, which says, well, you can't do a new service connection. You can't serve an existing service connection with more withdrawals from the river. And the point was, and this is actually the same point as the generic uh, proposed legislation, is if they're not in violation of the trespass code, then why do we have a CDO? And um, Eric Ekdahl, the deputy director, said his counter was, well, maybe what we do is we keep the CDO in place so there's still reporting obligations, but we relieve the community of all the guardrails. But, and this is the, the key, but, but they don't want to get into having to interpret the numbers, the supply and demand study numbers. They don't want to have to independently verify the drought resilience of ASR or pure water Monterey expansion or the customer demand going forward. It would be really helpful to them if this phase two uh, is resolved at the PUC before we come to them for lifting the CDO. So um, they will be intertwined, um, no doubt. Uh, the other thing Eric said is Aqua is the single largest uh, source of disinformation about the water rights bills uh, in Sacramento. So um, they have a completely different view <laughs> than, uh, than Aqua does about uh, water rights reform, uh, obviously. But hmm. anyway, um, so that's in the package. And then there's... Um, uh, I've included some of the letters where our logo was uh, included in a coalition, and those are just just there for for your viewing, for your use. And uh, and then the end, as I mentioned earlier, was the letter to find science office on the Dream Act. So that's what we've been up to here in the last quarter. You've been very busy. <laughs> It's, it's good. Yeah, it was, it's good. it was good to actually get to Sacramento. One of the things we discovered is um, Coastal Commission, Public Utilities Commission, and State Water Board and the EPA in general, people are not back to work. They're working remotely. And so mm -hmm. the EPA building is like a ghost town. They've closed the cafeteria. You used to come in and you would have, um, you get like a lobby pass. So you could just kind of hang around and go to the cafeteria. That's closed. They're storing chairs from their meeting room in a portion of the lobby. It's it's kind of bleak, a little depressing. Then you run over to the new temporary, well, it's not temporary anymore, it's the office building for the legislators, full of people coming and going up the stairs, down the stairs, meeting spaces and so forth. But um, yeah, we found that Nobody really wants to meet. I was going to meet with our state uh, grant representative. And he's like, uh, did you want to meet downtown at the offices or maybe a <laughs> coffee shop near my house? <laughs> it was like, Travis, let's just, you know, we'll just keep meeting electronically. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, but anyway, it was a positive meeting with uh, the state water board. He did suggest that when we come to try to remove the CDO, it would be best with CalAM. But even without CalAM, they will consider us, even though the way the CDO is written, it's a CalAM obligation. Um, he would like to see a coalition of us and maybe the business community and others saying, please relieve us of this. And I think that's a reasonable solution. Yeah. And then his final piece of advice is you got to be more present and meet with our board members because Calam is up there all the time. Of course. So, so we'll take that to, to heart and try to get back up to Sacramento in person, do some meetings uh, and so forth. But uh, Well, why don't we include that as a, a an item on our next uh, committee agenda, uh, just whatever, whatever follow up, whatever update there is. Yeah, and I that. think we, we need to think through how we approach the, the business coalition because it's in their interest to lift the CDO. 
very mm. much. Mm. But but in order to to express that interest, they're going to have to depart a little bit in their undying support of Calam and the desal plant because you're not going to get a desal plant in the near term. And if you want to get a meter set and build a project in the near term, the only one that's going to carry you is Pure Water Monterey expansion. And so we're going to figure out how that dialogue uh, gets played. And then there's a second dialogue that Fran is aware of. Well, and actually you're all aware of because we went through that, uh, the rate study, that the current rate case is putting 10% of a revenue increase on everybody but single family, which means it's multifamily and uh, non-residential commercial customers. And I don't think our business coalition knows that yet. Um, that they're the, Would you repeat that? I've had a hard time following that. Yeah, so the, the rate request for the three-year period is, and I can't remember the exact number, but let's call it 20%. 10% of that, a little over 10%, comes in the very first year. So that would be 2024, the test year. Yet, so if the revenue requirement goes up, you know, by more than 10%, that means that collections from rates is going up, you know, 10%. But the increase in the single-family residential rate structure is less than a 2% increase, I believe. And I don't have the number in front of me right now, but it means all of the other increase is on the backs of institutions like you know, cities, county, um, DLI and uh, Naval Postgraduate School and commercial businesses and multifamily. And multifamily is about, oh, 20 to, 25% of total water use. So that could be significant and they don't have a, a real voice. But um, so at some point, huh. you know, we, we used to have a, a fairly strong tradition of going to speak to the government affairs committees of MCHA, MCHA the you know, hospitality, uh -huh. um, the chamber, uh, the business coalition and so forth. So at some point we will go back on that trail with these two issues. Um, you're being asked to foot the bill for the rate increases and we need you to join us to lift the CDO. So that'll be something. Do you think that, that they really don't know about it? I think uh, that they don't because Bob McKenzie used to um, become an intervener in a lot of these things on behalf of the business coalition um, and MCHA would, um, and let's let's ask Fran. Fran would yeah. know. Usually, the business interests participate in, so they have a, a someone representing their interest in the rate cases. Um, Fran, you probably yeah. Look, Mackenzie files for um, Coalition of Peninsula Businesses, um, but it's more like a placeholder. Holder. What we found in the amended water purchase agreement on Phase One was he had um, the the chamber um, uh, hospitality sending um, letters directly to commissioners yeah. right, when they were getting ready to make decisions and didn't bother to really participate. And it's irritating me um, because they have an opportunity in these proceedings to provide yeah. formal testimony. And they're bypassing that, even though they're getting copied with everything um, as a party. But but they're and not they're, actively participating, and they used to. Norigi, uh, yeah. John, so they, when John they haven't there, had their hands slapped about for doing that. Not yet. Yeah. But I'm getting ready to object um, yeah. at the appropriate time because I I think it's uh, disrespectful to the process. Um, you know, to come in as a party, it means that you intend to uh, actively participate. Or if you're more limited, uh, you you announce that at the get go. He never does that. I mean, he basically says we want to be a party, and after that, he's been pretty quiet. The last time Dave, we saw any real activity was on uh, when the 2018 when uh, the CPUC was going to approve the desale project. Right, and they haven't been involved in rate cases very much at all no. except the. 2013 decision when we redid the uh, rate categories from tiers to yeah. 
for commercial. Well, you know, they, they, it's a public proceeding. They can uh, uh, subscribe, you know, they can be in, informed of what's going on, even if they don't want to participate. So it, it would be surprising to me if they're not aware of it, but it's possible. Yeah. Um, but it, I, yeah, I, it does sound like we need to prepare to um, to talk with them. Yeah, and one one last thing, while the mayor is still on, um, it it has been brought on more than one occasion that Seaside and Monterey, with the uh, city halls, have vast lawns that fall under the definition of non-functional turf. And that is the type of thing that the state is trying to come at. Um, so we'll we'll keep you very informed. Um, I know that in the last drought, there was a similar prohibition and the city of Coronado has these very large uh, medians in a couple of their boulevards and they had them declared parks. They actually had a, a resolution of the city council to declare them as parks and public spaces, which in fact, during the 4th of July parade, that's where everybody set up their lawn chairs. So at least one day a year, it was a park. And I know that uh, the last two mayors um, prior to Tyler of Monterey have said, well, you know, Colton Hall and the City Hall uh, steps, th this is a, a uh, area of free assembly and public uh, uh, events, and therefore it's a park. Um, so just something to think about in Seaside, if, if this legislation comes down that would leave your City Council, you may want to declare it a park somehow or something. If I could, through, through the chair, uh, quickly, I would say that's a, that's a great suggestion. That's probably what we're going to do. We use the uh, our city hall lines at least twice a month. Uh, you know, anybody knows anything about city hall? I mean, Seaside City Hall. Uh, we're our public is on that grass at least two, at least twice a month on average. Yeah, and we didn't have any guidance during this last throughout the declaration by uh, Newsom as to what really is non-functional turf. So we had to come up with our own relative to cemeteries, um, you know, and I think, and we did that jointly with Cal-Am to say, well, you know, is it non-functional? Well, you know, I, I think our determination was it is functional like a parkland because, you know, people walk it and visit and leave flowers and things. And so it has a, public purpose, but, you know, you start splitting hairs on these things and, um, you know, they want you to not water the medians, but water the trees. Well, that's a little challenging. <laughs> so we will be watching that one. It's just, it's, um, uh, it'll be interesting to see how they define it uh, yeah. and, and whether it passes. Yeah. Okay, uh, just to go back for one second to the business coalition um, and chamber, if, if the if any of the directors can be helpful in any way to reaching out, um, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe Supervisor Adams, Chair Adams, maybe the Mayor, um, or any of us, if we can help with that outreach or participate in some way to to call on your board members yeah. to I'm help. I'm texting John Norigi right now. Well, you know, since he picked okay. up the, the Laguna Seca thing, he hasn't been seen or heard from with the Business Coalition. So that was a promise that he made to me. Really? To do, to do back what? Away from water. <laughs> it's worked. Well, okay. Um, Director Mayor Oglesby and uh, Supervisor Adams, do you have um, in mind any agenda items for our next our next meeting beyond what we've already discussed? No, I don't have any. Um, I don't either. The, okay, if if something comes to mind, of course you can send an email uh, to Dave and the committee members. Uh, and I have a couple of questions for Lori, if maybe at the end of this meeting, she and I could stay on for just a couple of minutes. Sure. Okay. Do we have any other any other matters before we adjourn? Hey, just while I have you, um, KIF, K 
KION called from, they were downtown Monterey and Kim Cole sticked them on me uh, to talk about whether there will be water for the arena numbers uh, housing wise. And so uh, who, who knows how they'll edit it, but I basically said, uh, yeah, plenty of water. Pure Water Monterey expansion is gonna be more than enough to meet all of the housing needs. Um, so there's that. <laughs> there's that. Good. Good to know. Okay, well, if I get a right. response from John, I'll let you know. Thank you. Right. Okay, all great. Right. Thanks so okay. much. Good meeting, Karen. Thank, Thank you, you all. We're adjourned. Thank you all. Okay, so okay. Um, Sarah, don't, don't hit leave yet because uh, Lori and uh, the supervisor are going to stay on. Yeah. And All thanks right. to those of our consultants who stayed with us to the bitter end. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Karen. All right, Mary, what can I do for you? Well, thank you. Just two things. I didn't want to say this during the meeting, but do you know for sure that the $20 million that um, was in the governor's uh, budget for our Pajaro um, area of Monterey County, it remained whole? Can you, is that something easy to find yeah. for you? Yeah, well, uh, hold on. Yep, let me, let me just do a quick search. Um. <clears throat>